Hi guys, are you guys frustrated owning an E60 M5, thinking there's no solution? Are you frustrated understanding that there's a rod bearing problem and you don't know what the, how to fix it, you don't know how to handle it, and you don't necessarily know what sort of solutions are available to you? Well today I'm going to give you a little bit of an explanation behind this and how you can manage those E60 M5 rod bearing issues. And so these problem areas are typically found in the E60 M5, the E63 M6, and the BMW M3 with the S65 engine as well, because the S65 and the S85 engines all susceptible to similar issues, and that is the rod bearing problems that we're going to talk about today. And if you've seen in my other videos, you'll know that I've described some of the issues, some of the symptoms, and the, the, the overall issue that exists out there that owners tend to find themselves dealing with for the long haul. So today I want to explain to you guys some of the solutions and how you can manage these weak bearing issues and how we can you know own these cars for a long period of time on as low a cost as possible and ensure you enjoy these cars as much as you possibly can. So this video is going to summarize some of the tips and the tricks that you can apply and some of the solutions at a higher level that what you can utilize to potentially extend the life of the E of the E60 M5 with the S85 engine, of course the V10s. Now as a background of history here, do you realize that the V10, so the S85 motor that is in the E60 M5, was actually partially designed by an F1 team and BMW to put together the technology and the engine that they were looking for that really brought the street and F1 technology together in one package. Now do you also know that F1 engines inherently are very very finicky. Do you also know that tolerances built into an F1 motor tend to be so tight unless you preheat the engine and they typically wrap the engines in hot blankets and basically preheat them to the point of just prior to starting them so the tolerances loosen up just enough to start the engine and get everything turning and lubricated. So that's how tight the tolerances are. Well unfortunately when you design a streetcar with similar technology and of course I'll say the F1 technology is loosely applied to the S85 engine of course it's not like for like of course as you know if it were you would be preheating your car every time you took it for a drive so naturally the E60 M5 motor tends to be a detuned softened up looser version of an F1 engine now that being said it still has very tight tolerances and these tight tolerances and the technology and the large reciprocating masses V10 engine the high performance nature and its high revving ability all contribute to the fact that these engines have an issue in the rod bearings. And so let's talk about some of these issues and how we can get around some of these things. So the first thing you have to look at are the bearings themselves. We know the tolerances have been proven to be very tight on the bearings. So that in itself is a contributing factor. How does that become a factor? Well, with tight tolerances, what ends up happening is it prevents the oil from getting between the rod bearing journals and the rod bearings themselves, thus creating situations where you get excessive heat and you wind up with extended bearing wear and premature bearing wear because the oil is not getting into that interface space. So as a result, you see bearing rod bearing problems. So one solution is to look at a different rod bearing design, of course, and a clearance. So do you use a rod bearing that is of the same tolerance but a harder material? Well that was one train of thought. Or do you put in a rod bearing that has a looser tolerance, similar materials? That's another option. Or you use combinations of both, sort of a hybrid where you have a looser tolerance, a harder material that can also potentially contribute to more success. When you're rebuilding or if you're doing your bottom end, that is one application, is changing the rod bearings not using the factory stuff, actually utilizing some of the great aftermarket versions that have been researched, tried, and have a better success rate than you're typically finding from the factory. And some of these bearings have, for example, w WPC 
treated bearings, for example, is kind of a stopgap. It's one of those type of scenarios that it gives you a bit more time, a bit more longevity. So it gives you a harder and smoother surface, thus creating less friction, less heat, and less wear. So a revised bearing design, it, you know, really essentially plays a part in extending the life of the engine. Of course, aftermarket bearings with improved design is also going to be a requirement pretty much if you're looking at driving the car hard consistently. Are you tracking the car? Are you going to supercharge the car or apply a stroker kit? You're going to want to utilize a better, stronger bearing that's going to support these increased horsepower applications and higher rev applications. You're going to want to use a better bearing. And this is scenarios, these are scenarios and examples of where you want to ensure that you're putting the best bearing in place to support your engine. So the next thing, the next tip is looking at your oiling. Regardless of whether you're upgrading your bearings or you're not upgrading your bearings, oiling is extremely important in this car. Even more so than most cars, of course, as these things have typically a rod bearing issue. So two things. Number one, you want to make sure that the oil is changed frequently. Don't extend them. Don't, don't draw them out too far, too long. Always change your oil. Change it frequently. Change it much, much more frequently than BMW even recommends. The onboard computer is very, very liberal, should I say, in its evaluation of how the oil needs to be changed at its respective intervals. As, as a result of that, you can wind up with oil that is far beyond its useful life and that can contribute to bearing issue as well. So you have to, it's critical, it's imperative that you change your oil very frequently and far more frequently than BMW even recommends. I would change it less than 5,000 miles as well I would make sure that you're using the right type of oil. So on the oil topic, part two to this. Now you're going to want to use a high grade oil. Don't just grab that, that generic liter of oil off the shelf. You're going to want to make sure you do the research and that may come in a video in the future here. We might talk a little more on the oil specifically. But generally speaking, you want oil that is a high performance, high grade of oil. You want typically a racing oil and more importantly, you're going to have to investigate and check the zinc content. The zinc content must be higher than normal oil or typical oil. You want a higher zinc content because zinc in itself is an additive that will provide additional performance harder under higher pressure conditions, i.e. under heavy load or racing conditions. It'll allow the oil to do its work under higher heat conditions. It overall will help the oil do its job much, much better, and it will create a stronger interface between the bearing and the rod journal, thus reducing the potential for premature wear. So high zinc content, racing oil, and the correct viscosity are critical in this engine, far more critical than even most other engines out there. So the next tip that you've got to consider, and everybody talks about, is proper warm-up. And I've mentioned this before, and I didn't really give a lot of detail about it, but the proper warm-up of these engines is, again, far more critical than is even required in a lot of other engines out there and a lot of other cars. Why? Again, we're talking about a car that was very closely designed based on some F1 technology, therefore it's got tighter tolerances, and as a result, heating and proper heating, as I mentioned before, F1 engines are typically preheated, these therefore also have to have the proper operating temperature before really driving it excessively. So what you want to do is essentially make sure the car is heated up to about 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Or if you code your car, you can get that, you can get that temperature readout. But basically what I'm saying is the car has to be effectively really warm. You want the RPM gauge and you know it's got the sliding tachometer. So you want the tachometer to be all the way at the 8250 RPM range. That's going to be a close indication that your engine is more or less up to operating temperature. So 220 degrees Fahrenheit, your red line on your gauge indication should show that you are ready to go at the higher temperature. And only in that condition is the car ready for serious driving. Now there's other things. As the car is warming up, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to not move the car up to that temperature. I would recommend that you don't drive it significantly hard don't race the engine, don't drive it heavy under load. So there's two things that can really harm this engine and the bearings when the oil's not up to temp. Number one is heavy load. So 
putting the foot to the pedal to the metal, even if the RPMs aren't very high. So what you're doing is you're loading each bearing very hard. If the engine's not turning very quickly, but you're putting a lot of load on the, on the bearing as a result of high internal combustion pressures, that will put excessive pressure on those rod bearings. And if you don't have the proper oiling to support, that will hurt your bearings. The other thing is over revving it. So conversely, revving it very high. So revving it too low and revving it too high are both, unfortunately, contributors to failure of these bearings. So revving it up to 8200 RPM before it's really ready to go, that in itself will also take a toll on the bearings. So you want to basically keep it in the nice, comfortable, sweet spot. Don't drive it hard until you see the car is properly warmed up. Go through the proper warm-up sequence. A little piece of information here for you guys happens to be around the question of what if I have a 2010 and later model year? Or what if I upgrade the bearings to the factory 2010 and a half model year bearings, replace them, put them in the car? Well, there's a train of thought here too, and there's been some indication and some research that shows that that is actually a higher failure rate than some of the early cars. Wait, hang on, listen up. There is some reasoning to support that. Now here's what's, what's going on. The earlier rod bearings are a combination of lead and copper. Lead and copper is highly detectable with blackstone oil analysis testing. So you have an idea, a premature idea, that you're starting to see wear and you're starting to see accelerated wear. You're going to get trace elements of copper and lead in the oil as a result of your analysis. Now utilizing the 2010 and a half model year bearings, it is comprised of tin and aluminum. And now tin and aluminum are a much harder bearing, which on one hand is a bit of a solution for the overall issue of premature rod bearing failure. But the problem is, is it still tight tolerances and you're still going to see wear in the bearings. More importantly, the bigger problem with the tin and aluminum rod bearings happens to be the fact that you can't really detect it to the same, the same degree of accuracy on the Blackstone testing. So you don't have much a heads up. All you have is when it finally decides to fail. So on one hand, there's some advantage in the later bearing, but on the other hand, your way of evaluating the failure or impending failure is much poorer than the earlier bearings and therefore preventative measures are much more difficult to predict on the later style bearing. And that takes us to the last tip and that happens to be Blackstone oil analysis or oil, oil testing. Now while it's not super cheap, it is a good way to get a general sense of the condition of your bottom end of your motor. So what, why is that important? Well if you do oil analysis, it's really effectively to protect the rest of the engine. Some people think, okay, running to failure is a good way to go. Sad part is if you run to failure, you wind up potentially taking out your crankshaft. You take up your crankshaft and that becomes a much, much larger bill to the tune of fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. You try to avoid that if you at least bit possible. As well, if you leave this go too long, you can wind up with trace elements of copper and lead, of course, in the oil circulation systems, potentially wiping out your vano system. So that's another potential issue. So the oil testing and oil analysis through Blackstone is one of the best measures that you can utilize if you have a car typically with higher miles of 60,000, 70,000 miles is already pushing your luck, I would say. Some cars have already seen significant wear at 40, 50,000 miles, but I would say a safe bet, you know, it's, if, you're, if you're over 60,000 miles, it may be a, a time, it might be a place to decide to start doing that analysis on your oil. So everyone, I really hope that shed some light on some of the tips and tricks to help extend your, the life of your S85 engine or S65 engine, of course. I hope this helps you guys a lot. The intent here is just trying to extend some of the longevity, improve your, your odds and your chances of not having a catastrophic failure. But at the end of the day, these are all stopgap measures. And at the end of the day, realistically, Almost every S85 engine will see some form of wear on the bearings. Even if you treat it right, you're going to see more wear than you might see on your average motor. So at the end of the day, everybody, I hope that shed some light on it for you. I really hope you guys come back for the next one. I'm going to share more information on this whole S85 V10 
bearing issue as well as some of the other factors around the BMW M5. Of course, I love this car immensely. It's not without its faults, but of course, let's get through some of this stuff together, guys. Make sure you give it a thumbs up, comment below, and more importantly, share it and subscribe to my channel. I'd love to see you guys come back for more. Be part of this community. I want to hear from you, and we'll talk to you in the next one. See you then, guys. Bye-bye.